Bibles this morning, would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 37? And I want to, to begin reading in the 12th verse. I know that Pastor Randy began this series last week and he uh, launched us into some great stuff talking about the life of Joseph, living the dream. And, uh, and I want to talk about how sometimes and often when God puts that divine dream in our hearts, he calls us to something, he leads us towards something. There are all sorts of moments along that journey where uh, we could say the enemy comes in, we can say that it's God taking us through dry places, but there are detours that God assigns in our lives. And so we left Joseph, let's start in verse number 12. It says this, now his brothers, this is Joseph's brothers, had got to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. And then he sent him off to the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they're grazing their flock? Oh, they moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But when they saw him at the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer. They said to each other, come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a, a ferocious animal devoured him, and then we'll see what comes, becomes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from the hands. Let's not... So I'll take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this because he, he to rescue him, him, him from them and to take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. And as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spice and balm and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to, to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, sell him to the Ishmaelites. And not lay our hands on him. After all, he's our brother, our own flesh and blood. Anyway, you can see where this is really off. His brothers all agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver, about $20, to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. What, what can I, where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, dipped the, blood, the robe in blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see if it's your son's robe. He recognized and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. And then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning I will go down to the grave to my son. So his father looked up for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Amen. A lot of ground to cover here, I know. But I, uh, I wanted to, to just make sure that we got the full sense of what was going on in the, the life of Egypt. Pastor Randy last week began this series about living the dream. And he, he got us to that place where Joseph has these dreams, you know. These dreams of greatness. That he is going to become the leader of his tribe. The, the one before whom all his family will bow and give reverence. And, and, and he is just stupefied at how great his life is about to become. And you can imagine, can't you? Because he's had two dreams, not one. God confirmed it twice. His greatness is about to just be revealed. And so he is living the dream. And, and isn't it wonderful to have a sense of destiny about your life? I mean, it, I don't know how, I hope you all feel that sense that God's hand is on your life. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper, not all these wonderful things. Isn't it wonderful to have this sense that you are walking in the favor and the blessing of God? Can I get an amen? amen. I mean, it's, it's amazing to have that sense about our lives. And this is where we, we leave Joseph. This is... Uh, you know, he doesn't know the whole 
deal entirely. He's a teenager. He's kind of working things out, trying to figure out how great this comes to be. Uh, you know, but he's, he's imagining that it's already happening, that people are beginning to revere him because he's got this brightly colored coat and now two powerful dreams. And, and, and his whole attitude, uh, I imagine, begins to shift. It seems to be reflected in the story. He's gone from being the second youngest brother to being a little more outspoken because, you know, he's about to be the leader. And so everything that his father owns is about to become his. And so, you know, he's he's tattletaling on his brothers when they're doing bad stuff because that's what leaders do. You know, you, you step in. You make sure everybody toes the line. You, you manage. And this, this is where he's at. But and as, as sure as he is about his great future, his brothers are just as doubtful. As, as certain as he is that greatness lies in front of him, they are angry. About every little thing that he does, they doubt his ability. He is so different from them, and we'll see more of that later on. He is their last choice. If there's an election, he loses as tribal leader. But he was God's choice. God's hand was on his life. But I have bad news, because if you're in that place and you have had that dream, that sense about your life, something's good, something good is on the way, I, I, I have bad news, and it is this, that life is not always smooth. Life is not always serving, it's not always even. Even when you're walking in divine favor, even when you're walking in divine destiny, life does not always go the way you thought it would. There can be some terrible detours in life that happen. There are moments that are so difficult, so awful, that you can begin to wonder if you really had a dream from God at all, if you really read that scripture right, if the God that you believe you serve is really the, the God of the universe because, uh, because things have gone so badly off. And in those moments, you can begin to, it can be hard to keep yourself emotionally and spiritually afloat because you believed this was going to happen and this is happening. It's that, that apparent contradiction between the two that, that are so hard and you can begin to feel like after a while, like you're in a, a dark pit, like you're in a place of such deep brokenness or disappointment or failure because of things you thought were going to happen. Didn't happen. Maybe it can't happen in your mind right now. And that's where Joseph is as we walk into our text this morning. And I want to I want to talk about the unexpected and the unwanted. I know you didn't come here to hear that, but I want to talk about that in our life. A couple of weeks ago now, we were on our way from Vancouver to Edmonton. You know we were there for weddings. We had Brock's wedding in uh, Kelowna, and then we went to Zach's place in in Vancouver, and we were on our way uh, to uh, Edmonton in a little Hyundai accent. Now, if you don't know what that is, think of a shoebox. <laughs> Had wheels, take away the AC, and you pretty much have it, two door. And, and we, we, uh, we packed, uh, see, uh, Alyssa, his fiance, had already gone to Edmonton, and we were in Vancouver. And day by day, Zach is getting more and more agitated. They're calling each other more. He's missing her more. And finally, he said, we can't wait any longer. We had planned to stay a little longer out on the, the coast, and, and we need to go. And so we got up early. We uh, booked a, a new place to stay, and, and we packed up this little car, put our stuff on the roof, because not everything is going to fit in that car with us. I'm just going to say that. And, and, and we began this journey. And the, and the fastest way from Vancouver to Edmonton is, is what's known as the Coquihalla Highway. It goes through the mountains. It's got tremendous uh, vistas and, and lots of drop-offs. And it, it's just this beautiful, magnificent scenery. And then you drop down into Kamloops and you jump onto what's known as the Yellowhead of the Trans-Canada Highway to Edmonton. Uh, I'm telling you all that for a reason. We, we slipped down in, out of the mountains and down, are headed down into Kamloops. And as we, we are driving into the city, there's a parking lot in front of us. Uh, so there's been a terrible, very terrible accident just ahead of us. And we have passed the last exit. There is no way to get out of where we are. 
Are you there with me now? We, we, we are stuck along the highway for about an hour. The accident is terrible, and there's nothing we can do. And Zach is starting to get agitated, and he's phoning Alyssa saying, we were on our way, but we're stuck here, and there's nothing I can do. And, and we're just trying to stay calm. We're making friends with the neighbors. We're sharing our snacks, trying to be light, because he's getting more and more agitated by the moment, because he is supposed to be where she is, and he's supposed to be, I mean, that's in his mind. He's, He's got to help her out with all of the arrangements. And, and so there we are, stuck in this moment. And finally, after about an hour, the police clear a little lane off to the right-hand side. And they allow us to just sneak by the accident. It's all blocked off. You can't see all the terribleness that was there. And, and, and we were going by. And I remember looking up and seeing this sign. And I said very quietly, because I'm not the navigator. I am simply an observer in the car. I've never done this trip before. Zach has done it many times. And I, I remember this sign. And I just said, Highway 1 to Jasper. Next exit. And... Because I've never done this before, it didn't bother me when he went hurtling by the exit. Because I was sure that Zach knew exactly where he was going, even if I didn't know where we were going. And so he is, as soon as the, the, the road clears, he's putting the pedal down, he's starting to go, he wants to get us to our de destination. And so I'm just a spectator. I'm thinking, oh good, we're, we're making up time now. And then all of a sudden, Zach went, no! And I went, oh. He said, that was our exit. I said, I meant to mention that that was our exit. And it's the only exit, by the way, to the Elmer <laughs> Highway that you can get to. And the, the road beside us is blocked. The police are not letting anybody through. And we tried to go through the city, and they blocked the road through the city to go all the way up toward where the Yellowhead stops. So we, we drove around for a bit, and finally we stopped at Wendy's because there is absolutely nowhere that we can go. And as good parents, the only thing we can do is appear happy and order salad <laughs> and pray. And we're, we're madly checking our Google Maps, and they tell us that, that the, the, it's about 4 o'clock. The road is not going to open until 8 p.m. And we're stuck. And, and we're asking our neighbors, all of the people around in Wendy's, does anybody know another secret tunnel that will get us out to Yellowhead? And everybody's saying, no, that's the exit, and there's no other way. And finally, we did find someone who said, well, if you go 45 minutes down the road into another community, anyway, it's a long story, and I'll leave you with this, we made it, okay? Zach got married, it was a beautiful wedding, uh, you know, and all that, but detours. I'm not a fan. I'm just, I'm just going to say it. It's not my first rodeo when it comes to detours, both physically and metaphorically. There have been many times in my life when I thought, I need to be there. And some roadblock came in my way. And all of a sudden, I, I couldn't get to that thing I thought I was supposed to do, that place I thought I was supposed to be. Something stepped in the way, and, and, and I was stuck. And I suspect I'm not alone in that. I suspect I'm in a room full of people who've experienced detours. Can I see your hand? We've all had moments in our lives when, when the things we thought that should go a certain way didn't. And, and, and what I wanted to say about all of that from Scripture, and I'll get to explaining a little bit of that more deeply in a moment, is that detours are, those moments are not detours to God. That they're detours to us, but they are not to him. In fact, some of the things that we find most frustrating, some of those moments that seem most dark, most hard, are really God's ultimate purpose for our lives. And this is where we find Joseph this morning. Where we're going to begin to launch into this story today. So Jesus, just come. Help us to understand what you want to say to us. Open your word to our hearts. And let us hear what you want to say in Jesus' name. So every story has a plot line, and, and, and every good story has a crisis point, a challenging experience, a dark and dangerous struggle, and we have just walked into it with Joseph. He, he has been living the good life. He is the favorite son of a wealthy father. He's got a brightly colored jacket to prove it and dreams to, to, uh, to hold on to, to indicate that he is God's favorite and not just his father's favorite. So life is good for Joseph. But, but if you've been tracking with us at all through this story, then you know that he is from a seriously dysfunctional family. 
His father still has three wives of the four he started with. His brothers are a mess. And, and a hot mess. And whenever I read this story, I always wonder, how is it possible that Joseph comes out of a family like this? I mean, how is it possible that such a good, wise, godly young man emerges with 11 brothers who are as wicked and as cruel as this group of guys were? And privately, this is just for free, privately I wonder if the only way that Joseph could become the godly man that he became was for God to take him out of that situation and plant him in an entirely different place. That's just for free. Like that's, that's just my thoughts. The Bible begins, the story begins with, with the Bible saying that the brothers decided to take the sheep down to Shechem. And you should be alert the minute you hear that story. Shechem, what? Shechem is 50 miles, a five days journey from where Joseph is. We already know that they don't like Joseph. They've gone five miles away, I'm sorry, 50 miles away from where Joseph is. They are putting distance between themselves and the dreamer that they don't like. And more than that, if you read the word Shechem, you said to yourself, self, you said, I think I've heard that name somewhere before in this story. You'd be right if you thought that. Because not that long before, Joseph's two brothers, Levi and Simeon, had killed every man in the town of Shechem. And his other brothers went through and robbed the place blind leaving him pretty much bereft of anything. And so now they're heading back to this place. And you need to understand, the minute we read that story, you need to under, read that word, you need to understand that no one in that neighborhood, the surrounding tribes, want anything to do with these brothers being anywhere near this area. This is a bad place for his brothers to go. But they are so angry at Joseph that they go to the worst possible place, and then not only do they do that, they are still so angry that knowing that's a bad place, they go another day's journey on to Dothan while they try to figure out what the rest of their life is going to be. And the Bible says that Jacob is worried about his sons. Well, duh. I mean, he's worried they're going to burn down another town. He's worried that they're going to do something. I mean, his boys are not good boys. They are, they are trouble from day one. And, and so here is, here is Jacob worrying about his flocks, worrying about his future, wondering if the boys will ever come back. And if they do, what kind of trouble they'll be running from. And so uh, he sends Joe. And Joseph says no problem because he's the great future leader. He thinks that they will just listen to him. And the Bible says that they see him coming. They just put six days journey between themselves and this guy. And he won't go away. And so they see him coming and they, they talk to one another and say, let's kill him. Let's, that's it. He's far from any kind of help. Let's wipe this guy out and we'll never hear about his dreams again. And his older, you know the story. We read it. His brother rescues him from that, but they still are very angry, and so they grab him when he comes, they rip his jacket off, they throw him down in the pit, and the Bible says that they, after doing all of that, they sit down to eat, as though this is nothing that they have just done, and, and, and they sit there to plot how they are going to bring him to an untimely end, and Joseph is down in the pit listening to all of this. And Genesis 42 tells us that he is down there in anguish, pleading for his life. He's hearing what they're saying above up there, and he's begging them, please don't, guys, I'm sorry. I don't know, I didn't realize, you know, he's a young man, he's made some mistakes, and he is in this terrible, dark, broken moment. No doubt the source of future night terrors, and he's cries out from the bottom of the pit to his brother. And his brothers must be, must be contemplating what his future really will look like. He must be beginning to wonder where, where, do, where does life go from here? What happened to that grand dream that God gave me of all my brothers bowing down to me? What happened to that tremendous sense that God had a clear plan for my life that seemed so strong just moments before? For all intents and purposes, everything that he thought about his life is now over. It's gone. It's, it, there's no way for it to be rescued. There's no way in his mind's eye that he will be ever, ever be the leader of this group of men. Because if this is any indication, who wants to be their anyway. He's at this dark, hard moment. 
Because you've been there in your life, and maybe not as dark as that. But if you've been in a moment where, where all your dreams came crashing down, where all your great thoughts for what your future was going to be suddenly seemed to evaporate and fade, when your aspirations get shattered, when the future starts to bleak, be bleak, and you understand the despair, the frustration, the anger that just so easily seeps into your life. And I want to briefly talk about what Joseph's experience means for us, what his life, and I know we're doing this in the context of his whole life, so you know the end of the story, but he doesn't. He's stuck in this moment. But understand, what does this mean for you and I in these dark moments when we're questioning God, when we're wondering about our futures, when we're concerned about what life is about to, to, to dish us? Because detours happen, but they do not represent an end plans and the purposes and the love of God. And I want to introduce you to a word that's going to be significant throughout this entire series. It's found in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20 and, and it reads this way. Joseph speaking to his brothers. This is at the end of his life. He says this, as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. And the word I want to leave with you is that, that word meant. It, it simply means to mean or intend. It's the past tense of that word. And in the context of Joseph's life, Joseph is now looking back over his life and, and he's recognizing that, that all that happened to him, in all that happened to him, God intended something. That God has purposefulness and providence about what goes on in our life. That although things seem bad, although people appear cruel, although the circumstances are hurtful and appear to be out to destroy us, this is not God's intention. What we learn through Joseph's story is that God is always working behind the scenes of our lives, planning good ends and divine destiny for us. He means and purposes to do us good through everything as terrible as this moment is. God is working for good. I love the way that Tony Evans says, Providence is the hand of God in the glove of history. The truth is, behind every story of your life, behind every hardship, behind every success, behind everything that has happened, there is the loving hand of God. And God has this dream, this plan, this purpose for your life that is not deterred by the detours of your life, by the circumstances you are facing, by the employers that are hard, the teachers that are difficult. Nothing, nothing can stop the purposes and the plans of God. And I want to leave you with three thoughts this morning that just kind of come out at me as I read the story of Joseph. The first is this, that divine detours are inevitable. I'm sorry, don't throw things. But the truth is that detours happen. The truth is that every one of us has enough experience to know that there are moments in our lives that are hard and difficult. Joseph, as a teenager, this is kind of a new experience and everything seemed to go his way. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth in many ways, but he's just discovered that just because you are a God, you have a god birth dream, just because you are super talented, just because your mommy and daddy love you, it doesn't mean that everything in your life is going to work out exactly the way that you want it to. Joseph thought his life Life was about leading this small tribe, about bossing his sister and his brothers and making sure that they all did the right thing. But now in this moment, everything goes upside down. No doubt he has this moment and he imagines to himself, this can't happen. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? But God's dream was bigger than Joseph's. His, his plans for his life required a, a bigger perspective and some character building. This All that needed to happen in Joseph's life for him to become the man that God wanted to, him to be required a detour, a delay, a devastating moment. Friends, you can hate me for saying this, but the same is true in our lives. In all of our lives, there are, there are these moments. God's plans are bigger than ours, and he brings us to these detours, these hard moments, so that, so that we will learn what really matters. 
So we'll come to understand what eternal significance is all about so we won't get caught up in the petty and the small and the stuff of the day. He takes us on these detours so that we'll learn to pray, so we'll learn to trust, so we'll learn to see things the way he wants us to and, and to become the people that he wants us to become because that is his plan. And friends, this morning, if you've got breath in your lungs, God has a plan for your life. You have a role to play in the kingdom that God is building. And if you find yourself stuck in a terrifying frustrating pit. It's, if you're feeling discouraged, take this moment and understand that God still has a plan for your life. He is working there. Secondly, I want to say not only are they inevitable, but they're necessary. And they, they're necessary because they get our attention. Isn't it funny when life is good how God seems, you know, he's there, but we don't really need him. When life is good, we, we, we are so distracted by my stuff. We're so busy enjoying the goodness, the sunshine. But then trouble comes and all of a sudden our hearts turn back to God. All of a sudden we're driven to our knees because we need help. Because we all of a sudden realize that life is bigger than us. When we hit roadblocks and crisis of faith moments. When we're in places where we have no other choice. All of a sudden we realize that all we can do is trust God or be miserable. Some of us have found a way to do both. Because I need to be honest, I hate detours. I hate it when I have to go off map, when I have to trust in something that isn't on the Google Map system or something that's not on, a, a, a requ a, on, a, on some kind of a, a simple path or plan or someone can't tell me how to get where I need to go. It's aggravating. But those moments are necessary. They're necessary because in those moments, God does things in our lives. I remember the hardest season in my life, this is off my notes, but I remember as a, as, as a, there was a hard season as a young pastor that we went through. It was about two and a bit years of living and working in a very difficult moment. And every day I would go to work asking Jesus to find me a new place to go to work and find me a, a different way to do the things that I needed to do. But it was in that season that God taught me to pray. It was in that season that God sowed deep things into my spirit that he allowed his word to come alive and fresh and new in different ways that he allowed me to become the person that I am and, and, and it was in those moments that God began to shape and work my life for Joseph he sees this detour and, and, and he can't understand how it's possible that, that he's in this place because he's trying to learn to lead but God was trying to teach him how to follow Joseph needed to learn how to trust God when life is hard he needed to learn how to treat others in a certain way, how to live with integrity. And this detour that God planned for him was God's way of bringing all that to pass. And I know it's not easy to hear, but it's true for us. In those hard moments of life, God shapes us. He molds us. He creates us into the people that God wants us to be. In those moments, God becomes our source. Lastly, I want to say that divine detours lead to destiny. And, and I know we kind of left this story on a cliffhanger, but, but the story finishes with Joseph, you know, heading off to Egypt, and, and in his mind, the story's over. I don't know if you've ever had a story's over moment. I don't know if you've ever had a moment where you looked at the circumstances and said, if this is what life is going to be like, I'm done. I'm done with Jesus. I'm done with God. I'm done with church. I'm done with going about all that religious stuff stuff that I grew up with. I am finished. But as he rides off towards Egypt, I suspect that's exactly where he is. He has, uh, if God allows people to go through what he's going through, how can he serve him? In his mind, all of his choices have, have evaporated. His, the rest of his life story is going to be written by other men. He's, a, he's going to be a servant in a foreign country. Perhaps he's tempted in many ways just to, just to give up altogether and just lose hope. But if you thought those things, if you thought those things, you're wrong. Because God's plan for your life is still there. God's purposes for your life are still open. For Joseph, his life is just a beginning. Detours are simply a different way. I, God would say his only way for us to get where he needs for us to be. And I, I want to speak to you this morning in just very simple words. I want to remind you that if you're in a place this morning where you feel stuck, 
If you're in a place where you feel discouraged, where you're questioning what your life is about or where you're supposed to go, maybe somewhere along the line you thought God was about to do something and he hasn't done it and you're frustrated and you're, you're, you're questioning whether God cares at all about your life. I want came here this morning to tell you that detours are not forever, but they're taking you to somewhere good. Because God's plan for your life is good. And the answer to your circumstances this morning is learning to trust God in the midst of the detour. It's learning to obey God in the midst of the hard moment. It's learning to allow God to speak truth into your life, the God who does all things well, who works everything perfectly according to his plan. He will do that. He will take you where he promised he would go. So Jesus, as we draw this service to a close, I pray for the people in this room this morning. I pray for the, those who come to hear your word. That, Lord, you would speak to them. I pray for some, Lord, who come into this room. And, Lord, I started this morning early thinking that, that for some reason there were people coming in in a very dark place. People coming in today who are walking through very hard roads, who, who don't know what tomorrow holds, who are concerned whether you are holding your hand or leading them anywhere, Lord. If, if that's true in this room, Lord, I pray for those people right now. Lord, I pray that you would speak to their hearts right in this moment and you would remind them that you are at work in their lives and the detour, the circumstances of this moment are for this moment and they are for their good and they are necessary. They are taking them somewhere. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you begin to breathe life where there has been death. I pray that you begin to breathe hope where there's been discouragement and I pray, Lord Jesus, that you begin to breathe healing where there's been hurt. Thank you.